This is a film that um, had its premiere in Austin, Texas, in South by Southwest uh, in March, and then it went to Lucarno, and now uh, John is doing a tour with in, other, in other festivals. And uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, it is uh, we, we see it differently uh, from the time I've seen it um, for the first time in, in Austin, because um, the uh, main actor and uh, character in a certain way of this film, Eridin Staten, passed away uh, last September. Uh, John is uh, um, an actor with a great career, and this is his debut uh, film as a director. And uh, thank you for being here with us. Thank you, obrigado. Thank you for coming out tonight. Um, I, I'm so grateful to be here in Lisbon. Uh, uh, this is my first time in Portugal, and man, is it beautiful. Uh, wow. So that's awesome. And uh, I'm so pleased, uh, and thanks to um, uh, Arambique and also to um, uh, the festival for having us. Uh, we're so thrilled to share this movie with you. Uh, and to, uh, well, just to show it to you and talk to you about it. That's, that's why I'm here, and I'm most grateful that you all came to see it. Enjoy the movie. Thank you. Thank you, John. So we start this Q and I. So we can begin. So how much? So uh, when did it come to you the idea of making a film about this character, and how much of this character is Eridin Stanton? Because Eridin Stanton is uh, uh, an actor everybody loves. Uh, uh, singers, they make songs about him. Yes. And uh, we have seen him mostly in second roles, sometimes even for a few mi minutes, but they were always very important for the plot of the film, and mm -hmm. they are in our memories. So we c I can recall the Tulane Black Top 5 by Monty Hellman. It just appears a little, but it's very strong, his appearance, or even the, the film David Lynch made, The Straight Story. Mm -hmm. We are uh, always talking about him, and he appears only in the end. And the main roles he made, so so um, we recall Paris, Texas, and then this film of yours. Well, the, the movie was uh, inspired by Harry Dean and the two men who wrote it. Uh, Drago Schumanya and uh, Logan Sparks wrote, this, wrote the screenplay and then um, asked Harry to do it after they wrote the screenplay. And uh, uh, he said yes, and then they reached out to me to try to fill out the cast and asked me to play a part in it. Uh, Drago is an old friend of mine. I've known him for quite a long time, and he knew I had been trying to find the right thing to direct for a long time. And um, when a couple months later, when they were still looking for the right director, he asked me if I would consider it. And uh, so my relationship changed from being potentially a four-day commitment to a two-year commitment. Uh, and uh, so I agreed to that. I, I thought that the script was lovely, and uh, and that uh, we started work on it. And Gratefully, because our lead was 89 years old, um, we got it done in less than a year. <laughs> and uh, and uh, also gratefully, you know, he was able to do it, and it's a, such a wonderful performance. Um, and uh, we did not know when we finished that 14 months later he'd be dead, uh, two weeks before the film opened, which changes the relationship of you as an audience to him, obviously. How did you do the cast? Um, was it only your choice, or what, what did you have in mind? So this, this character of David Lynch as well, uh -huh. this is very uh, peculiar. Well, everybody, I mean, obviously everything, everyone in the movie was chosen by me <laughs> uh, at some level, uh, but they were all one phone call away, everybody in the movie. We didn't have a lot of time, so it was like, who do you know that you can call? Uh, and that was our list, like, what about these people for this role, what about these people for this role, and that, so we started mm -hmm. uh, doing it that way, and then um, we were looking for Howards, we had a couple of people that we'd reached out to who had either been, were too busy, mm -hmm. or were physically not able to do it because they were ill, and um, actually David, I mean Harry said, what about David? And uh, we talked about it, the group of us talked about it, and was like, well that'd be great. I'd seen him act in his own stuff, I'd seen him act in other things. I'd also seen him uh, with Harry on film mm -hmm. in Partly Fiction, this wonderful documentary that was written, that was 
Sophie, uh, Sophie's documentary, Hooper's do documentary. Uh, so I knew that their chemistry was palpable on film. Mm -hmm. So I was like, uh, yeah, that'd be great. So then the question was, would he read it? And then would he like it? And would he have time in the midst of doing 18 hours of post-production? Post-production on 18 hours of television, would he have find time to do it? And all of those things happened. And uh, he came in for the time we needed. Only t we, he only worked on the movie for two days. It's the second largest part in the movie, and he did it in two days. And um, he just came in and nailed it. I mean, it was, it was a wonderfully weird and delightfully disarming performance. Mm -hmm. And how was it working with Ari Dean uh, the daily, in the daily uh, shooting? Um, I mean, Harry, we started working on the script uh, in the weeks coming up to production. Every Sunday, we'd go up to his house. And he would uh, mute the game show, and then we'd talk about the script for a while, and then he'd go, well, I guess you guys know your shit, and then he'd go back to his game show. <laughs> and then, uh, then there was one week where it was like he turned off the television, and he faced us, and he goes, okay. And he went in, and that, that went for three and a half hours of like, why would I say that? What is this about? That's, I wouldn't say it that way. Those kinds of things. And um, we got done with that that meeting and we were walking out to the cars and one of the producers said to me, I'm afraid he's going to, I'm afraid he's going to quit. And I was like, no, 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 this is the first day I knew he was doing the movie. Like, mm -hmm. I knew that he was in because he was fighting with it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was the process from then on and I, uh, that made perfect sense to me. So as an actor, so then it was a question of trying to find the right vocabulary in a quick succession, a very short, uh, Film, filming schedule to kind of help with the, with the context of each scene quickly between the two of us. And that was the process that um, the first couple of days of filming took. And after that, it was basically a rhythm of we'd rehearse, he'd go away, we'd set up the shot, then he'd come back and he goes, <laughs> and he'd go, okay, where are we in the movie? Mm -hmm. And then I'd have a description of, okay, this is where we are. And you go, okay. And, and, and any note I gave him from there had to be about that moment in the movie mm -hmm. because he wouldn't respond to anything that was about any other moment in the movie, mm -hmm. um, which was very different for he and I because I will respond to notes. Like if a director says to me, I want you to play it this way because 30 pages from now you're going to play this scene in the exact opposite fashion, I'll go, oh, okay. No, not Harry. He's like, what about now? And that's and kind of it, the did process. Did he change a lot, uh, the script that was written? No, he didn't change. No, 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 he didn't. The movie has four ad libs in it. That's about it. Everything else was written. Yeah, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't change, he didn't change anything. Uh, but there were funny moments because it's so inspired by his life. There's biography of him in the movie. Uh, there was a moment where he was talking, I forget which story it was. Uh, he goes, I would, never th I would never say that. <laughs> and Logan, one of the writers, goes, you said exactly that, <laughs> word for word, last week. <laughs> and the, the uh, Liberace one was really funny because he goes, why am I going on about Liberace here? I mean, what's that about? Why am I even worried about Liberace? What is the point here? And uh, I talked to him about why, the, why I felt these two scenes. Again, I was thinking of structure. I was like, well, it's juxtaposed to the scene in the diner where these three people, young people, are sitting, at the, at, sitting in your seat. And I told him why I, think that, I thought that worked. And, um, and then Logan jumped in and said, you know, Harry, you're, you're not a homophobe, so you don't really, he goes, what do you mean? He goes, well, I mean, you've been so, you're so tolerant with everybody. You don't have this problem. He goes, I was in the Navy in World <laughs> War II. Of course I had that problem. But then, and then he just basically went into the whole thing. He goes, but then I thought to think to myself, why am I worried about who he's screwing? Let him get laid if he wants to. So it was literally, he said the exact same thing when he's going, why am I going on about this? It's like, that's why you're going on about this. It was hysterical. Well, any questions from the audience? You worked with some of the greatest directors and actors, uh, and uh, could you tell us uh, about your personal exchanges, the most memorable personal exchanges with some of them? Maybe something that... Um, I'll t I guess I could say 
uh, there's three really great anecdotes. One is um, uh, in the first film I did, the first film with a part, real, real part was Fargo, and I had had a conversation with, um, with Fran beforehand. We had had lunch, and uh, we were talking about Norman Marge's relationship and how they might have met. We were, you know, kind of spinning a backstory for ourselves, like the, the biography of their relationship. And so the first scene I shot was with Fran and a friend of mine who's an actor, Bruce Bonney, and um, we were eating Arby's in her office. And he comes in with news about the case. And I turned around and I'm looking at him and uh, during the rehearsal and then uh, Joel comes over and Ethan's right behind him because that's how they work. They're like, they have a mind meld, the two of them. And uh, Joel goes, yeah, you don't really care about her work at all. And I was like, really? Because we were talking for, you know, <laughs> we were, she was, yeah, we were talking about maybe when they met on the fourth. No, no, he doesn't care. Um, okay, so I'll play it that way. So then I see the movie, and I realize that uh, it's so vital that Norm doesn't care because she can see the foot in the wood chipper and come home, and she's safe. She doesn't have to worry about that. He doesn't care about it. All he cares about is her, the baby, and duck stamps. That's it. Uh, that made perfect sense to me. Now, uh, another one of those moments was I was in Gran Torino with Clint Eastwood and we were doing those scenes in the barber shop and B. Vang, this very young actor, Hmong actor, was working. First movie and it's a huge part. And it was like the second day of performance. And he was really nervous and uh, there was a moment where the camera was being moved and he, I'm standing in a corner with him and he goes, how, how am I doing? And I go, oh, I, I think, and the minute I started to answer, Clint was all the way across the room, and he just like immediately made a beeline. Like he saw that we were talking. He goes, "What are you guys talking about?" <laughs> and I said, uh, "Well, he's just wondering how he's doing." <laughs> and he just looked at him and he goes, "Tell the truth. You'll be fine." <laughs> Which is really good advice. Uh, so there's a couple. Those are really good advice. Tell the truth. Hello, good evening. Good evening. I can't stop myself thinking about the comic character Lucky Luke. He's a cowboy, uh -huh. he's submissive, he likes to smoke, and he disappears on the horizon. There is no horse, jolly jumper. But yeah. I can't stop thinking about the parallel stuff. Yeah. Uh, did you think about it? Um, Morris went to America, he really liked Westerns. Um, Thanks a lot. I, I think the I think that the kind of, it's a poetic film. It was intended to be a poetic film. Uh, it, there's things that are definitely resonant. Um, you know, you can't have Harry Dean Stanton walking around in the desert and not bring up Paris, Texas in everybody's minds. Uh, and the same thing is true of that, you know, exit. It's a very, it's a cowboy exit. It's a, it's a hero's entrance, it's a cowboy hero's entrance. He's like a gunfighter putting on his belt to go out to be the sheriff of the town at the beginning. So, so um, you know, we, t we talked about the movie as uh, what if John Ford were to make a character piece, you know? And uh, that's why the vistas were so important to the movie and why the vitality, the kind of weird fragility and vitality of the desert is metaphorical to the character. So, yeah, I, I, we thought about, uh, yeah, we thought about it. <laughs> we thought about it, yeah. Good evening. Um, like uh, when when watching the, f the film, I, I uh, saw some some shots that really left me intrigued. Like there were lots of low angle shots that um, instead of putting him in a prestige position, you, you just saw Aridin Stanton really confused and not really knowing what to do. And for this not to be a, r a weirdly specific question, I'm kind of asking you, how, do, how did you plan on the visual aspects for it to uh, coordinate with the story? Um, the primary thing uh, visually that I wanted to make sure of was, uh, well, you talk about you know, uh, whether or not he's, uh, um, uh, the first time we see Lucky, this is a, actually a great way to describe it in really simple terms. The first time we see Lucky's face, um, it's in a classic hero shot, right? It's straight up, it's, he's big, he's 
huge in the frame with this beautiful blue background. And then the next, the very next shot after he smokes, and it says Harry Dean Stanton is, they cut to, you cut to a vista where he's this big. You know, he's this big on the frame. And that's the relationship. It, it reminded me when we were working on the visual elements of a moment in reading Moby Dick where uh, Melville writes this, uh, writes this portion in I Am Ishmael, Call Me Ishmael, the first ch chapter that says, um, um, in the book of providence, I'm paraphrasing obviously, but in the book of fate, uh, this is what my whaling voyage might look like. And on the page when you read Moby Dick, in huge print it says, war in Spain. And then in tiny, tiny print under, under it, it says, whaling voyage by one Ishmael. And then he writes a 600-page novel. And that's kind of how I felt about the relationship. Lucky's, Lucky's life is this big. But to himself, he's the hero. <laughs> he's the hero of this little life. I, to me, I don't know if it's about glorifying it. I'm the hero of my own little life. I don't think anybody else, like, uh, I mean, uh, if, you're, if you are wise enough and humble enough to make, to make your life about somebody else, well done. Uh, most of us don't, and we live lives this big. Most of us. So I don't know if it's about glorifying it or, or anything. I just think it's an observation that's kind of true. It's tr let me put it this way. I feel it's true in my own life. Uh, so it made sense to me that that's, how lucky, how we see lucky. Thank you. Um, love the film, by the way. Thank you. Um, I'm sort of slightly intrigued by the, the shot at the very end. We sort of break the fourth wall, it felt like, and Harry Dean looks into the, into the lens. Um, I'm sort of intrigued, was that yourself? Was that Harry Dean Stanton? Was that something between the two of you? Um, I wasn't expecting it and it, it really sort of What did me. it do for you? I'm still recovering a little bit about it and obviously- Yeah, that's the way it was for me too. Yeah, and obviously since his death, it, it yeah, yeah, it's um, it, yeah. it was really strange, but yeah. obviously at that moment you didn't know what the future was gonna be. How did that come about, that show? Well, um, it, was the, it was the brainchild of one of the writers Drago Shumanya, uh, during the later portion of our post-production work, um, came up with that concept and wrote it into, we'd given a bunch of notes about the script that they, the writers were working on. I, I'd given some, and uh, one of the other producers is a wonderful writer and also a shepherd of writers, Iris Stephen Bear, um, made suggestions and that we all, you know, that were signed off on. And what happened at the, uh, that came back to us in a draft uh, which became the production draft, and uh, it it was exact. It was exactly right. Um, it landed in a, in the way it landed, and then when we shot it, it landed the way it landed for you. And and uh, uh, it's it's uh, yeah, it works. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, just a curiosity, who was the person in the phone? Um, uh, uh, who do you think it was? Uh, imaginary or... Uh, you thought it was an imaginary friend? Or, or uh, I don't know, a brother or something, or a psychi uh, psi uh, psychiatric... Those are really good answers. <laughs> yeah, those are really good answers. You're welcome. Uh, good evening. Good evening. Uh, congratulations on the movie. Thank I you. loved it. Uh, you have a vast, wide variety of genres you worked in uh, as an actor. And now with this film, uh, I personally want to see much more from you as a director. Thank you. And it's such a specific role for Harry Dean Stanton. Is there any actor that you would like to tackle on a specific genre? I mean, there's people I love working with as, I, like there are, there are people I've worked with in the past that I would love to work with again in either the capacity of a scene partner or the capacity of a director. There are people that have such a, such a um, that I'm, I'm itching to 
um, collaborate with. And the great part about being able to collaborate from the director's chair is that you get to have a long conversation with them. So, yeah, there's a few people I'd like to do that with. Some I've worked with before and some with I, ha I haven't worked with. Um, that, but I would, I would, I aspire to work with them. Yeah. I'm not telling you, though. <laughs> <laughs> Any further questions? Hi. Uh, so I noticed in the final credits that uh, there were three people credited as uh, moral supports. Yes. What's the story behind that? Uh, I'll tell you that. I will tell you the answer to that. They're dogs. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> they're they're the producer's dogs. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Cosmo being one of them. I know. Yeah, they would come to the set. Uh, that's that's who they were. <laughs> okay, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thanks. And they were moral support, I guess. I never saw them. Because <laughs> I was on set, so I never saw the dogs. How did you cast the turtle? Um, the, we had an exhaustive search, uh, put it in all the papers in Arizona. No, we went to the Sonoran Desert uh, Tortoise Refuge. Uh, people who have had, to, like, uh, tortoises are the only pet that even if you get them, like say you get your tortoise at 20 years old, you still have to think, I wonder who's gonna take this tortoise when I'm dead? <laughs> well, you know, because, and which really makes me wonder like who's the pet? Um, but, um, but anyway, there's a, there's a place that uh, uh, saves, saves tortoises, uh, this specific type of tortoise which is indigenous to that area. And uh, so they brought out seven tortoises, um, and um, we chose, I chose the two most active tortoises. <laughs> and uh, I didn't choose the most beautiful one. It was sleeping. They all, had the <laughs> they all had the same name. They had just named them all the same name. Ernest, I think, was the name all of them had. And uh, how you get a tortoise to walk across screen is you take strawberries and you rub strawberry juice on the sides of rocks and they will generally follow that path, <laughs> generally, hoping that on the other end there'll be a bunch of strawberries. Any further questions? It works the same way with actors, by the way. <laughs> Just line, line it with food and they'll eventually find their mark. Mm. Well, if there are no more questions, uh, I thank you, John, thank for being you. here with us. Só queria acrescentar que este filme, tal como os outros filmes da competição, são filmes que têm também um prémio do público. Portanto, façam o favor de votar. But before you go, I understand there is an audience award for these films, and I just want you to let you know that uh, don't let my feelings that you are the most intelligent and beautiful audience you've ever seen this film <laughs> uh, affect your voting. Just let the film speak for itself, even though I find you all incredibly beautiful and talented <laughs> and intelligent. Thank you very much. <laughs>